Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art as Ecosystem. I'm Andrea Grover, the Executive Director of Guild Hall. This is a co-presentation of Guild Hall and the newly launched The Church in Sag Harbor, an artist residency, exhibition space, and creative center founded by Eric Fischel and April Gornick. We're pleased to also have Sara Cochran who helped to co-present this program. She is the executive director of the church and she'll be joining us towards the conclusion of the program. Art as Ecosystem is a conversation series that was launched in 2019 by Eric Fischel with support from Elise Trucks as an initiative of the Guildhall Academy of the Arts in which Eric serves as president. The Academy is an honorary body of 200 plus creative professionals affiliated with Guild Hall. As part of our 90th anniversary in 2021, we are building programming around the robust ideas and passions of the Academy members living and past. I'm pleased to begin to introduce tonight's guest. Eric Fischel is among the most influential figurative artists of our time. He is a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Eric Fischel and April Gornick founded the church as a new concept creative center in Sag Harbor. This is an innovative new organization which he will speak about tonight. Also joining us is Stephen Petronio. Stephen is a choreographer, dancer and artistic director of Stephen Petronio Company. His work spans 35 years and addresses the intuitive and complex possibilities of the body in shifting cultural contexts. His training originated with leading figures of the Judson era. Stephen has created over 35 works for his company and has been commissioned by some of the world's most prestigious modern and ballet companies. He has collaborated with artists of every discipline, including members of the Guild Hall Academy, such as Cindy Sherman, Donald Batchelor and Lori Anderson. Tonight, he will discuss the inventive work of Petronio Residency Center. Emily Simoness is an entrepreneur, teacher, facilitator, and former actress and acclaimed orator. She is co-founder and executive director of Space on Rider Farm. Emily has worked with premier theatrical venues such as the Public Theater and Williamstown Theater Festival and has developed acting curriculum for NYU and the North Carolina School for the Arts. She co-founded Ty Dyan for Biden and helped raise over $165,000 for Democratic candidates during the 2020 election cycle. Since its inception in 2011, Space has helped artists and activists develop new work. Emily is here tonight to talk about the work of Space on Rider Farm. Mary Jane Marcassiano is our moderator. She is a fashion and costume designer, film programmer, and producer, as well as a social entrepreneur and nonprofit leader. Marcassiano serves as director of strategic partnerships for a Cinema Tropical, a nonprofit that promotes Latin American cinema. And she is director of development for Impact Repertory Theater, a program for under-resourced youth in Harlem. Her NYU master's thesis was entitled Upscale, Scaling Up Nonprofit Capacity. It explored the nonprofit sector as ecosystem and inspired the title for this series. I'm pleased to welcome Mary Jane, who will introduce the program. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you to the Guildhall staff, Elise Trucks, our co-producer, Josh Gladstone, artistic director of the John Drew Theater, and Patrick Dawson, our tech host tonight. A very warm thank you to Eric, April, and Sarah for inviting me to produce this talk. I'd also like to thank Space on Rider Farm board member Robbie Stein for introducing me to the project and to, and to Emily, and to Jill Brienza, board chair of the Stephen Petronio Dance Company for telling me about the residency program. In 2019, Eric created the Art as Ecosystem series to measure the health and vitality of art beyond the marketplace. The 2019 talks featured prominent art world members, artists, private collectors, artist foundations, educators, and executives. One of his guests, Rick Lowe, creator of Project Row Houses, was the inspiration for tonight's discussion. After his presentation, I became fascinated with the idea of how artists create and define community. So tonight, the focus is on this aspect of the ecosystem. 
Tonight's guests are genuinely multidimensional members of the art ecosystem. They have elaborated on or transformed their original artistic careers to include community building. Their disciplines are theater, dance, and the visual arts, and their projects span in age from 10 years old to newly opening. The topics we'll discuss tonight are what was the motivation to create their projects and the challenges in envisioning and launching them? How do they define community? And how does equity issues impact this concept? Uh, towards the end of the conversation, we'll take questions from the audience. If you can type them into the Q&A um, box on the bottom of the Zoom, uh, we'll answer as many as we can. So to start the evening, each of our panelists will tell you a bit about their projects. Um, I'd like to introduce Emily Simones um, to start. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. What a group. Uh, so yes, I, my name is Emily. And I am the co-founder and executive director of Space on Ryder Farm. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the founding story. Um, Ryder Farm has actually been in my family since 1795. Uh, though I had never visited the farm, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The farm is in Brewster, New York, about 80 minutes north of uh, the city. I had heard tale about this place as a kid. It was sort of folkloric, uh, this place on the East Coast, <laughs> stuck in the middle of the country. Uh, and I lodged it somewhere in my, in my memory. Um, it wasn't until uh, I moved to New York City in 2007. And on a lark, I called, called my fourth cousin once removed, Betsy Ryder in 2009. And I said, hi, I'm related to you. Um, can I come check out that farm? It's been in our family since the dawn of time. And she said, sure. I was an actor at the time. Uh, and to be clear that day, I had no intention to be doing what I'm doing today. I had an intention to get on a train, leave New York City, check out this place, take a picture for my mom, uh, and that would be that. Uh, that is not what happened. Uh, what happened that day is, is really three things. I had three aha moments. The first uh, is that <laughs> the fact that uh, one would refer to Brewster, New York as upstate is charming. Uh, it is not upstate. It is about 80 minutes north of the city. So the first thing was, oh my gosh, it's so close to New York City. Second thing, oh my gosh, it's not eight acres, which is what I had imagined. It's 127 acre expanse. Wow, there's woodland and there's pasture and there's lakefront and there's these beautiful 1795 uh, buildings. Third aha moment, and, and perhaps the one that, that has me speaking to you um, is that I, I opened the door to the 1795 homestead uh, and it was clear that it hadn't been lived in or taken care of for a very long time. Uh, it was in need of tremendous uh, TLC. So I left that day, couldn't stop thinking about it. Now, another thing I couldn't stop thinking about is that at the time I was 25 and I was an actor and I was in a community of artists, many playwrights and directors that didn't have time and space to work on their creative pursuits. New York City is fantastic. I hope you would agree with me, uh, but it is perhaps not, uh, it could be argued that it is challenging to make creative work there. So these two needs, artists need for time and space and my newly realized need of my long lost family homestead's need for rehabilitation were independently rolling around in my head. They collided. I thought, have I got an idea? I am gonna bring my scrappy 25 year old artist friends up to this 225 year old homestead. We're gonna make capital improvements, think spackle, paint, et cetera, and we'll get to work on our art. So what started as a sweat equity arrangement, quickly by 2011, um, we had filed for our 501c3 uh, nonprofit status and cut to 2021, we're in our 11th year of serving artists. And uh, in those 11 years, we have supported about 1400 artists of all stripes. Um, I would say about 60% of the artists are theater artists, writers, but we also support uh, dancers, filmmakers, visual artists, um, social activists. Uh, folks join us for one to five week, fully subsidized creative residencies. Um, and there are three mandates on your time when you're in residence at space. You have to attend the three communal meals daily. Two, you have to give back a little bit to Ryder Farm. And three, 
um, you have to share some of what you created at the culmination of your residency. So that is a very fast, uh, fast forward, but basically founded the organization in 2011, 10 years later, uh, here we are. And the one other piece of it uh, that makes it even um, <laughs> more unique perhaps uh, is that the farm has been a working farm in its, in its most recent iteration uh, since 1978. Um, and in 2019, Space on Rider Farm, the nonprofit that I run, uh, took over the organic farming operation. So now we are one part artist residency program and one part organic farm. That is the history. Um, when I think about the place and I think about the community that it serves. Um, I think it's it's worth noting that that community has really changed over time. Not only has um, it grown for being not just a place for theater artists, but for all stripes of artists. But I think most specifically in um, 2017, the organization made a commitment to grant 50% of its residencies to folks of color and other underrepresented voices. Um, and I look at 2017 as really the moment that the organization um, really changed in, in who it was serving and the intentionality of that service and the transparency of that service. I think it's important to talk a little bit about the why that that commitment in 2017 was made or, or sort of how that came to pass. So I said that one of the mandates is that you have to attend three communal meals daily. Well, I sit at all those meals and I have conversations and many conversations over the course of our June through October season with all sorts of artists. So I would sit at these tables and I would have conversations in the early days. So this is like 2013, 2014, 2015. And what started to occur to me is that the collection of people around the table were really homogenous in all the ways that we think about homogeneity. So uh, race, geographical location, age, type of art. Um, and, it, and it wasn't necessarily bad. It was that a conversation that happened in June with one artist cohort it started to become clear to me that a very similar conversation was happening in August with a different group of people, though because their um, perspectives were similar, it felt like, oh, you could really swap in any group for any group and, and perhaps we're not engaging the diversity of perspectives that could be really interesting and, and um, useful and perhaps um, our charge, right? And so we started to think about what are all the ways that the organization could, could champion more diversity? Um, and that is when we came up with a 50% mandate. Um, since then, um, we also, at, at the very, very beginning of space, um, there was a nominal fee for 50% of the artists um, to offset our costs. And in 2017, we zeroed out all of those costs, again, as a, as a way to reduce any barriers to entry. Um, so that's the bit about equity that has, per, that has continued to today. Um, it is a big part of our mission. Uh, and I feel very passionate that more and different perspectives uh, lead to hopefully a better world. So that is one of the things that we're trying to do in the community that we're creating. Um, I was asked to sort of contemplate, you know, what's at stake um, for the arts and, and the artist community that space has fostered and, and also what's at stake for agriculture in this moment. Um, and I've just been thinking about during this time, it's, it's been interesting to, to lead an organization with one foot in the arts and one foot in agriculture, one foot in a, a business farming uh, that has been essential this whole time during the pandemic. Uh, and then the art space, which you know we all know that it's essential, uh, but it was not deemed an essential business. And how those two things, how those two lenses have been so interesting to sort of um, be in conversation uh, and, and how I think we're seeing what happens um, 
in, in a culture that, that isn't able to, to sort of um, consume and be in community uh, with art and the, and the artistic process. Um, I could talk about that for a long time, but I'm gonna wrap up. What I will say very quickly, and this will probably be unique to me because I don't think anyone else is running a farm, um, but what's at stake for agriculture is quite alarming. Um, between 2011 and 2018, the American Farm Last, Farmland Trust estimates that an acre of farmland is lost to development every two minutes. Um, which is shocking. By the time I've been finished talking, we all have lost five acres uh, to development. So space's dual mission of supporting artists and activists and their work and you know, contributing to the sustainability of this place um, is really about how can we nurture both uh, the land and, and the artist and sort of what are the intersections? Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Emily. Um, so now um, I'd like to invite Stephen Petronio to talk about his project. Um, Stephen, thank you. Hey there, um, I'm Stephen Petronio. I'm the artistic director of the Stephen Petronio Company, which wraps in several different, um, uh, I think of it as, as, a, um, as a, a crown with several jewels in it. Uh, so uh, a crown for the people, crown for the artist people. Um, so I started out, uh, my company's 35 years old. It started out in, the very, um, in a very simple, direct way, a company to, um, to produce and, uh, and present the work of Stephen Petronio. And I did that in collaboration with many uh, beautiful artists over the course of many years. And then somewhere around my 30th anniversary, <clears throat> um, Merce Cunningham passed away. And then my mentor, Trisha Brown, became gravely ill. And so uh, first, I, so I did the unthinkable and I began to um, shift the focus or share the focus between my work and the works of these great postmodern masters like Trisha and um, Merce and Steve Paxton and Yvonne Rayner. Uh, I created a project called the Bloodlines Project. And, you know, honestly, it doesn't sound like much when I'm saying it now, but to shift the resources, the hard earned resources from things that support my work to other people's work was a big deal. And it was very frightening. And as soon as I did it, my entire life changed. And then, uh, and so I, the next level of change was um, I had been looking for a place for the company to work in the country. Uh, for a residency, uh, for a residency for the Stephen Petronio Company, and as soon as I opened up my mind a little bit, I realized that it was not about my company; it was about the next generation of artists. And so I, um, I had this idea to make the Petronio Residency Center, which I am the um, the, the director of, but the uh, I'm sorry, I'm the founder of, but the director is Maria Warshaw, who was formerly of Brooklyn Art Exchange. Uh, so she's kind of heading that program. We are a research and development facility that um, takes away all the problems of the daily life of an artist, a group of uh, an artist with a group of up to ten people. Uh, we feed them, we take care of them, and um, we set them free in our mountaintop reserve. So we have a little film that we're going to show you, and uh, it does a lot of the explanation. And I'll see you back on the other side of that. So Patrick, would you mind rolling that film? Artists are invited here to interrupt what they consider their normal chain of production or creativity. Um, and we interrupt it with quiet and nature. Um, they know how to produce what they produce wherever they go. But when that gets interrupted, it's a potent tool for, for creative advancement and change. So um, welcome to the top of the world. We're in Round Top, New York, and you're at the Petronio Residency Center at Crow's Nest. So this is the biggest tree house I've ever been in, and we call it the Perch. Every time any dancer has ever walked in here, they face this diagonal and 
you know, you could see them projecting themselves into space. When I was looking for just the right place to inspire the dancers that I that would be working here, I, I thought, that, well, the house is great. There's plenty of bedrooms. There's enough bathrooms. The studio is already there. Um, it just needs a little bit of uh, needs a floor and some lighting. But when I walked out here into this space, which we call the perch, my mind was totally blown. And I reached my arms out to both sides and I, I said, I'm not leaving until this place belongs to the company. The Petronio Residency Center at Crow's Nest was conceived as a research and development facility for the inspiring young minds of the next generation of dance makers. Um, we wanted to create a space for the makers of dance to be in nature, uh, cut off from the uh, distractions they normally have in their everyday life. And uh, this is the, the thing that we don't ever get when we're working in an urban center is undistracted time. It's a creative oasis where all the pressures of all the rest of the responsibilities melt away and they can get down to that essential place that's necessary to make a new work of art. It's really for the next generation of dance makers who desperately need the space to develop their voices. When I was a young choreographer just starting out, Trisha Brown arranged for me to rent the basement of 541 Broadway in Manhattan. 5,000 square feet for $100 a month changed my life as a dance maker. And so um, that generosity really stayed with me throughout my career and uh, it left a deep impression on me. And this is, uh, this is really a nod to that kind of gesture that Trisha made to me. This is conceived as a beginning stage research and development facility for movement artists to work outside of the pressure of pressures of the marketplace. There's no market driven ideals going on here. There's no deliverables that we ask for when we award someone a retreat here. I cannot express to you how important and how, um, how deep and how uh, organic the connection between all the artists can become when you're spending 24 seven living and working together. That can never be achieved in the city working for four or six or eight hours a day. Things that I've been hearing from the artists that come here uh, are that you can get more done in a week in this kind of quiet situation than you can in a month in, a, in an urban situation. The needs of a choreographer or a dancer are very simple. They need to eat, they need to sleep, they need to have space that they can move in. And um, I cannot tell you what it means to have the right space to go into the unknown and to the unconscious process that it takes to make a new work that's uh, undiscovered up until that moment. To the, to the naked eye, it just seems like a, a space. But this emptiness represents the potential of great works of dance. And uh, so to have the right conditions is super important. Right now, this is just a blank space, but next year, it might be the next great dance. So, um, so I just a couple things I want to say. Um, there are uh, several ways to get here. Um, there's the Petronio Residency Center Award, which is um, it. Uh, it's given. Uh, it starts with a nomination panel. Uh, a very diverse group of people from across the country nominate several ar several artists each, and then it's uh, there's a, a three or four panel of artists who make the final selection. So it's a producer and director driven nominations, artist selection. And um, uh, diversity is really, really important to us as well. It's part, this, this residency center is part of the umbrella of the Stephen Petronio company. But, um, you know, I am a white man over 60 and how to deal with um, 
the the, um, the inequity of, of the dance world is a very important issue for us. So uh, we've made that um, that panel as diverse as possible, and that's the beginning of understanding what our role is going to be in uh, in relationship to this uh, to this story. So you can get <clears throat> you can get an award by nomination. There are co-residencies that we also have. Uh, for example, I work with dancers responding to AIDS. We share the costs of um, of uh, a residency for a, a selected artist we, that we decide between us. I work with Dance Space in, in Manhattan. We do that every year uh, with funds from the Dance Force. We select an artist together and they, so we have a shared residency with them. Uh, recently, we've been working with Works in Process at um, the Guggenheim. Uh, so we've had a couple of artists up here uh, on shared residencies. Um, and now, and just very recently, we've started a new initiative, which is an, uh, an applied for uh, residency. So you can so you can apply for this residency, and it's called uh, Restore and Retreat. It's a pilot. We'll only be giving two of those residencies um, out, but uh, and we just opened it up to application. But you can go to Patron.io, uh, and you can hit on the residency button, and you'll find out more about that. The other, the last thing I want to say um, is the, um, you know, when I was looking for this space, I was hoping for 10 acres. I ended up with 177 acres of a mountaintop surrounded by, um, surrounded by uh, the Catskill Preserve. So we are protected up here. We're at the end of the road. It's a, you know, it's a dead end at the top of the mountain, and there's only bear behind us. So uh, I want this bear all around us actually. But uh, what I realized very early on was that um, this land needed to be protected. Uh, even uh, the board of directors that I, who I love so much, you know, we're, we're in control of this land, which was taken from the Mohegan Indians. So what can we do to remedy that? So we've just recently um, in collaboration with a, a very prominent foundation which I can't quite name right now, but we've put 77 acres into um, reserve. And so for, it, won't, it will not be developed in perpetuity. So it, although the company owns the land, it, cannot, it can never be, um, be um, developed. And now, so we have 90 acres left and we're working on the next preserve for that for that piece of land. So one of the giant missions of this company, since we ended up in this crazy place, is to, um, to merge the understanding of uh, what the importance of our environment is with the cultural agenda that we have. So really we started all about giving artists what we thought they need um, to make work, but putting them in nature where it's incredibly quiet and incredibly reflective has made us understand our situation in a new way. So we are now hoping to find a, a, a director that's as potent as Maria for the environmental programs that we hope to develop in the future. So that's what I'll tell you about the Petronia Residency Center and we could talk more later. Great, thank you, Stephen. And now we'll hear from Eric who is live from the church. Hello everybody and uh... Thank you for having me and continuing this um, uh, discussion over the last couple of years. Um, I, as you can see from the, uh, the two that came before me that uh, they're, you know, neck deep or waist deep in, uh, in trying to figure out um, the programming and the opportunities and the give back to the their communities that they're very attached to. Uh, we are at the absolute beginning of, uh, of that same journey. Uh, I hold them in high regard, uh, I'm, you know, inspired by the work of all of the artists that have uh, found ways to create opportunities for other artists. Uh, and, um, and so I, I take that forward with me into uh, this project that uh, April and I are uh, trying to put together. Um, the, uh, uh, the church, which it uh, was named by default, 
and by default, it, I say because when I bought the church, everyone in the village, everyone that knew me would keep asking, what are you going to do with the church? What's happening at the church? The church just became the name by default. And, it, and in a way, it's a, it's a kind of perfect name for uh, the, the, the kind of the archetypal level that I'm imagining we could function on. Um, the, uh, the church was uh, built in 1835, I believe, moved to its current site in 1864, decommissioned uh, as a church in, I think, 2004, and then went through a series of, uh, of ownerships that tried various, uh, you know, renovations for residency, uh, you know, uh, co-op residents, uh, private homes, and, uh, and um, a showroom for um, uh, handmade uh, wallpapers and other home decor. Uh, unfortunately, the, the church was in such bad uh, repair that it, it took a tremendous amount of money to bring it up to a structural uh, level that it could actually begin to function. And, and the person that I bought it from fortunately did that before I purchased it. So that wasn't a burden for me. Um, uh, April and I have lived in uh, Sag Harbor for 40 years, uh, part-time uh, for a lot of it, but since 2004, we've been here full-time. It's a town that means a great deal to me and to April. In, uh, um, I forget, I think in the 90s, uh, April got involved with a, a, a group of uh, people who were fighting uh, box stores from coming into the town. And uh, it became a very uh, dramatic, very animated uh, fight against big money and against uh, uh, turning this town into something that was pretty much just like any other town. Uh, four years ago, the cinema burned down. The cinema uh, sits in the absolute middle of Main Street and is an icon uh, and an identity icon for the residents in this town. It's got a great history to it. And uh, it burned down and it, and it became urgent for uh, people to buy it, to try to uh, restore it as a cinema because it lost its landmark status, uh, having been gutted. And uh, April was very much a part of uh, putting that together to purchase the property. The thing that stunned me was that they raised a, very quickly a million dollars from 50, 100 and 500 dollar donations, which showed me that there was a, such a broad base to a pyramid that absolutely wanted this iconic uh, structure, this cultural venue to be center of their town. Um, and then the other thing that stunned me was that the big money that came in to purchase the, uh, the cinema came from artists who had been very successful in their field. So within uh, film and theater, music, visual arts, they all came together to also say we want this to be part of this town and to, to be a, a cultural center for it. And that, uh, that got me thinking about other things as well. I, I had started a small residency out of a house in Sag Harbor and, uh, and it was just happened to be across the street from the, from the church. And when the church became available, to me, it was a no-brainer that this is what we had to 
to get. Because if we wanted to bring a, a kind of cultural vitality to this town, uh, we needed space to do it in. And uh, you know, the pictures that you're looking at here is the renovation of that building. We tried to marry uh, the intervention of the new with the integrity of the old without trying to hide one or blend it in, but just have it harmoniously be there. This was very much a part of the uh, uh, talent and the vision of uh, the architect Lee Skolnick, who uh, I have worked with for many years in different projects. And uh, I think it was very successful in that regard. The, uh, I, I wanna say something about the, the town of Sag Harbor. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know it, it's a town that's uh, out in the Hamptons area. It's on the north side of the uh, South Fork, the Bay Area, it's in a harbor. Historically, it was uh, originally um, a, a landing spot for, um, you know, people coming from abroad. So there, there was a first customs house was here. Its early industry was uh, whaling, shipbuilding, and, uh, and it's a town that uh, unlike the other towns in the Hamptons was always something that produced a product that went out into a global economy. And, and I say that because it, it has a certain kind of DNA that is cosmopolitan. The uh, diversity of the people that uh, have historically inhabited this town, who inhabit this town today, uh, speak to that um, uh, quality. Uh, there's a, a great range of, um, of uh, people from a, a you know, very uh, wonderful, very uh, uh, interesting historically uh, middle class and upper class black community that's here. There's a uh, uh, Hungarian Jewish population. There's a, a large gay population, a, um, a mixture of, you know, uh, craftspeople, um, uh, blue collar workers, and uh, uh, in industrialists, etc. And uh, one of the things that is a, is attractive about it is that it because of its cosmopolitan nature because it had a sense of itself in a larger world it's tolerant and that is what I think attracted people to it it's always had a uh, thriving art community as a part of it mostly a writers community but nonetheless a, a long deep history going back to uh, Herman Melville, James Fenimore Cooper, and moving forward. And um, it, it is something that I used to see as parallel to the, the production history of the town, the industry of the town. But over the last uh, um, 15 years, 20 years or something, Sag Harbor has been uh, moving in a gentrification way towards becoming just like the other towns in the Hamptons, which to me is an incredibly boring uh, and, and lost opportunity for some uh, town as special as this. So I had this uh, idea that in order to sort of slow it down, you're not gonna change the, the direction to any great extent but to slow it down and to make it interesting, wouldn't it be great if we could form the town based on the visions of the artists that are here in a way that made it an authentic uh, uh, environment. And we have uh, structurally a town that has on the south side the uh, Whaling Museum, the, the library and the church. In the middle of town, we have the new cinema 
And at the north end of town, we have Bay Street Theater. So we actually have created an arts district in this town. And uh, what I'm looking forward to is uh, putting content into that structure in a way that changes the, the reason that people come here, that they come to have an authentic artistic experience out of the different uh, uh, genres, different disciplines that uh, will be presented. Um, the, uh, uh, what we were, the ambition of the church in terms of developing the, the architecture for it was to a kind of build it, they will come mentality. We wanted to create a space that was large, open, uh, not predetermined about its uses, but trying to cover enough bases that it could be used for a great variety of things from performance to, to both musical and dance and uh, you know, uh, theater type events to uh, uh, visual arts exhibitions, uh, studio spaces, creative workshops. And one of the uh, uh, ambitions I have uh, <clears throat> came out of, a, of an experience with 9-11 uh, where I noticed that uh, this country went, was suffering terribly and they didn't reach out to the artists to help them figure out how to deal with the trauma that we had just suffered. That it wasn't an instinct to uh, um, reach out to the artist, to give uh, handholds, to give language, to give images that could be shared, ways of, of sharing experiences that could bring us back together. So that feeling of disconnect between what I know is the most important uh, aspect of art in a culture and the fact that it, was unneeded or seemingly unneeded uh, made me want to see how I could change that, how I could figure out ways to change that. Part of the, part of the problem is that uh, with the disconnect is that there's a, an illiteracy that has seeped into the culture where they actually don't know what they're looking at. And because they don't know what they're looking at, they don't know how to process it. They don't know how to participate in it. They don't know how to internalize it. So I began to think about ways to separate creativity from art. And it seemed like art was presenting too much of a, a burden, too much of an onus on, on people who didn't feel comfortable because they didn't know enough. And I, I was thinking about uh, as a kid learning baseball and starting out with you know t-ball and then and then little league and then school sports high school you know college and then on to the pros that that that, uh, that train uh, goes with beginning very early on to learn uh, uh, you know the rules of the game some of the you know manifest ma uh, you know sort of master some of the physicality of it. Uh, you know, the older you get, the more you get control of your body and you begin to be able to do more and, and the, the subtleties of the game become apparent. Uh, if you're really good at it, you keep moving forward into it if you're passionate about it. All along the line, the, the attrition rate is phenomenal. But the one thing is ab about it is that Everybody who's played the game knows what they're looking at. And they can tell looking at a professional game, who's playing well, who's not, what an extraordinary play was, what a great strategy, et cetera, et cetera. I want the same thing to, to happen with the arts. I want people to not feel that in order to create, you have to become an artist. Are, are, that happens so far down the road that it's not important to people to, to think about it in those terms. 
What it is important is to get in touch with the creative mind and the creative uh, spirit. And so that's some of the uh, things that we're thinking about in, in terms of programming uh, for the church. We're also gonna be running a, uh, an artist residency program. Uh, we have four bedrooms and a shared kitchen and studio spaces that will uh, facilitate uh, the residents, we're looking to have a variety of, of disciplines uh, all at the same time. I love cross-pollination. Uh, we're also going to be working with the local arts uh, artists uh, here uh, to um, create works or to, um, you know, to develop programs, et cetera, et cetera. As I say, we're in the very early stage of this, so it's, a, it's quite a, a dream still. But uh, uh, for April and I, it's a very exciting one. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it back to the panel now. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I feel, Eric, you have a very clear picture of how, um, what your project is, how it's um, a part of, part of the community. I'd like to hear a little bit from um, Emily and Stephen about the community where they're based, not the, not the community that you're bringing in. And how do you manage what Eric is, what, what his goal is to do is to mix the two. I guess, should I, should I go? Sure. Um, well, that's a crucial thing. And you know, of course I understood that, but I really didn't understand it until I got into the property. So I live in a, uh, I live up in Round Top. Uh, we live up in Round Top, uh, New York, which is uh, across the Hudson River. Um, in the, it's a more reddish era state, uh, county that I live in. And so there was some skepticism about what we were going to be doing, what craziness we were gonna be doing here. Um, one of the things we began to do immediately was develop our education program. And because we're not on Main Street um, the way you are, Eric, um, we, um, you know, we're, we're, this, we're this hidden away, tucked away private thing. So um, how do we engage with the community? So uh, the, the, um, our director of education, Marcus uh, McCabe, was a dancer with Dance Theater of Harlem. He already lived here. We became fast friends very quickly. He began to develop, he was already teaching in all of the schools in our county for free. So we raised money to give him a salary to do it through a Petronio Residency Center. So that they, we had began in our first season to have workshops for kids up here. And I cannot tell you, first of all, no one knows what the property is incredible and no one's ever seen it. So uh, the parents come and they hang out. We have a big 6,500 6, square foot house. We brought the parents up there. They were having lunch while the kids are dancing and taking their workshops. And, you know, it's a time out for everybody. Um, so the family gets to rest with their while their kid is growing into, you know, they don't have to go to New York or they don't have to go to uh, Westchester or, or or White Plains for a dance class. They can actually have a, a dance class in Round Top, New York. Go figure. Um, so we've been expanding our, our presence in the schools. We, we've reached over 1,800 students this year. And um, of course, we're into the virtual, uh, the virtual world of teaching now because a lot of the schools are not in session. So Marcus has developed a series of uh, videos that go. And sometimes uh, when Marcus would go into the school, he would teach a dance class in, uh, in place of gym or shop. So they had, the kids had that choice. Do I go to gym, do I go to shop, or do I dance? Uh, so uh, these, these different classes are now begging Marcus for, for his content because the kids really want, they need to dance. So that's one of the ways that we're, we're addressing uh, the community. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so, you know, it's been interesting. I will say that my, my thinking about it being place-based has really evolved. I think at the beginning of space, it was a place for my New York City friends to go. And I still felt very much like the community was the New York City community. Uh, and we struggled in the early years um, to figure out how do you be the servant of, of two masters? And by that, I mean, folks would apply to be in residence, 
And for them, that meant they're going to be tucked away and they don't have to share their art and they can be in process. And, and the product part of it was the city, right? So I, I found it very challenging at the beginning to sort through how do you how do you really honor that and then also know that there is this local community that that wants to know what it is that they're up to. Uh, and I will say that it is still that part of it is still a work in progress. What is less a work in progress um, is that when we started the farm, that for me was the 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 key that turned the lock in terms of the local community. Um, and very quickly, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but there's um, a concept in farming called a CSA, a community supported agriculture. So if you have a farm five minutes from you, you can buy into their CSA. And what that means is that for the course of their season, you can get vegetables from that farm. It's essentially like going to the grocery, except you don't get to pick all the things. You just get what is ever, you know, whatever is in harvest. So we really used that model, which is 18 weeks, June through October, to really start to make inroads in the local community. And there are two things that are unique about our CSA, and they're directly in response, I think, to that community. One, it's a sliding scale CSA. So wherever you are socioeconomically, there is a place for you. We do believe that food, just like art, is a human right, right? So if you're someone who needs to be fully subsidized, we have slots for you. If you're someone who um, identifies as low income, middle income, high income, and then we have a benefactor level, right? So those are folks in the community that are really able to subsidize other people. When the pandemic hit, we looked around and said, oh my gosh, <laughs> food insecurity is through the roof. And so this year we fully subsidized 50% of those CSA shares. So 65 families, um, got 18 weeks of uh, free vegetables. Um, and most of those folks are Latinx. Um, so that was also really interesting. Um, I am not a Spanish speaker and it's been very, um, you know, it's been incumbent upon us that if we're serving that community that we really have the tools to do so, right? So all of a sudden we needed to be um, hiring folks on our staff who are fluent Spanish speakers who can really meet that community where they are. Um, we also learned that a lot of those folks didn't have access to transportation. So getting to the farm was, you know, not possible. So we hired a driver and that person drove the shares to those people each week. So also the first thing about the community, for me, the biggest takeaway is like actually listening to the community, whatever that community is, the myriad communities about what it is that they need, actually listening to understand, not listening to hear what you hope you can hear and you know what reinforces whatever your plans were. The second thing about our CSA, and then I'll stop talking, um, is that in addition to farm fresh vegetables, we commission what we call CSA artists. And those artists create a, a work of homegrown art for the CSA community. So in addition to getting 18 weeks of organic vegetables, we give you eight um, pieces of art. And what has been really amazing about that is that it, you know, it's sort of what Eric was talking about, it's not, you know, if I'm going to be super, if I make a big generalization, it's not a community that has tremendous uh, fluency when it comes to art and culture. In many ways, there's, um, there's a, a feeling that it's not for them, right? And so by saying, no, you're part of this, you get food, we're also going to send you a print or we're going to send you a short story. Maybe not everything appeals to them, um, but it's a way to be sharing uh, the fruits, not just of our farmers, but of our artists. And I'll say the last thing that's been really great about the CSA is given the pandemic, every dollar counts. And we've been able to give those folks, you know, commissions of um, some money that, you know, helps them offset their rent, et cetera. So I will say that the community piece is, um, it's ever changing and it, and it requires deep listening. Thank you. I'm going to start to take some audience questions. And um, the first one is for Stephen from Brad Learmouth. Um, he said, uh, Stephen, as you reference the native peoples whose land you are now on, have you any plans to engage them, especially on the land you've set aside? Um, that's a great question, Brad. We're so I'm one, and this is just a general thing I wanted to say to both Eric and Emily, who know this really well, uh, or to say with them that uh, because what's unique about what we're doing is that we're artist driven uh, organizations. So, um, so 
we can, uh, as our as our understanding, as our thinking, as our creative process continues to be engaged, our organizations are, I would say, small enough. They're not gigantic, cumbersome um, uh, organizations that we can shift and grow. And in the, uh, so I'm four years old now, and the evolution of what this was when I started to what it is today is vastly changed. Eric, you're going to go through. What are you going to look like next year? I can't wait to see. And Emily, I know you know this. So do you personally look like, or do you yes, mean this thing? <laughs> both. <laughs> um, but uh, so uh, so, Brad, the um, the uh, preserve was just formal. The conservancy was just formalized three weeks ago. So. Um, you know, I basically have been focusing on raising the enormous amount of money that it took to do that and engaging with the foundations that were going to help us get this together. So, um, so no, and I'm more, I'm, I don't, I, I have less clarity about that. And I, and I want to be very frank about that. Uh, I know that this is um, like much of the land in Greene County, it's Mohican and um, uh, that those tribes were displaced across the river. Um, and, you know, and it somehow ended up in, you know, 200 years later ended up in my hands. So, or in the hands of the Stephen Petronio company. Um, so uh, my first instinct was, well, we can't, if, you know, when you have an organization like this, you have to worry about keeping everything running. And our basic goal is to give money to artists so that they can work. So the threat of losing this for financial reasons was, you know, it's always looming around. And so I thought the, the, the safest thing I could do is get it into conservancy as fast as I could. And that took me three years. So next stage is, uh, Brad, that question will become, that a little float to the surface. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so uh, Emily, I guess, you know, your story uh, strikes a chord in Long Island. So um, Denny writes, uh, Emily, the East End of Long Island is a farming, fishing, and arts community which goes back 400 years. You have accomplished in a short number of years about half of where we are. Funding is a must for the arts, and as now we are in a recession and a pandemic. Uh, one thing we have done is to create a community preservation fund, which gets a tiny percent of tax added on to all real estate sales. This helps us purchase critical undeveloped land to preserve. It's not really a question, but if you have anything you'd like to to contribute uh, or advice for Denny. Just thinking, no, I mean, I think that's, I think that's great. I think um, it's easy to take for granted the land that we have, the resources that we have. And, you know, the statistic about farms and the development is, is staggering. And I would just say like about the, the small, uh, you know, the farming community that you're talking about and the artistic community that we're talking about, you know, those, they can't be taken for granted, right? And I think that there is a, a synergy between those two groups of people. There's a scrappiness and an industriousness and an elbow grease, uh, but they do need to be bolstered by their communities, right? And I think as we look towards next year and then in the, the years after that, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, philanthropy <laughs> is going to be sorely needed uh, as we continue to, you know, wade our way through the pandemic uh, and then the, the economic fallout. And I think artists and farmers uh, are perhaps uh, not thought of as they should be. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up in a little while, um, but I, I, when we were talking amongst ourselves casually, um, sustainability came up in the conversation and legacy. Um, you know, um, Eric and Stephen, I know that's something that's on your mind. Um, Emily, you're much younger, but at the same time, you've given a lot of time to this project. And I know we've talked and you have some other ideas of things that you'd like to do. So how, um, how, how do you guys approach, how are you approaching this issue? Which is is that? What is you're you're muted? What is the legacy and sustainability? Uh -huh. How do you see the? How do you see continuing this projects? You know beyond beyond your own involvements. 
I, I, uh, I, I, I don't think you were in on the conversation before we started where I was talking about how I'm like the worst person to raise money, to ask people for money of, of the three of us. Apparently, Stephen and Emily are very good at being very upfront about the, what they need financially and stuff. So in terms of sustainability, I'm gonna put the, the onus of that on uh, our executive director and the board that we're forming and stuff to, to do that because I, I, I'm loath to, to ask. In, in terms of legacy, I think that I, uh, I there's a couple of things that uh, I've learned in terms of the trajectory of my career, uh, which is that, uh, you know, there's a, a tremendous amount of it has to do with uh, a desire, tremendous amount of it has to do with angels that you meet along the way, who uh, maybe recognize something in you before you are able to see it or to own it. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, timing and opportunity. And um, a lot of it has to do with trying to figure out what the, a the actual nature of your success is in relationship to your vision of the thing that you do. And uh, you know, I've been very fortunate in terms of um, being very successful at uh, the thing that I do. A lot of it I, I thought was uh, absolutely dependent on being very attached to, to New York City and to my generation and, and, and that moment at which we all emerged. And, um, and during my uh, years there, something happened that none of us could see, which is that the art world changed. And it, it moved away from being an art world to becoming an art market. And I'm thinking of this in the visual arts, uh, the others can speak to whether that happened in their disciplines, but it became an art market, which you know put an onus on the object and the process of making art that was very different than what I uh, believe in, what I uh, you know inspires me, etc. Um, and and what I also noticed was that because of the internet, ideas travel very quickly around the world. And they, 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 this th idea of a, of a central place uh, like New York used to be or Paris before that or Berlin or London, et cetera, et cetera, uh, became obsolete as, a, as an idea for creativity, for the necessity of it. Because the, you, you get so much in terms of your you know, uh, stimulation from receiving so much information very quickly, no matter where you are. And then it's just about what you do with that. And, uh, and so the idea of trying to move something away from the traditional notion of a center to find a, a creative vitality in a small town that is of equal interest to people, of equal significance to both people directly in their daily lives, uh, like Emily was talking about uh, in terms of her uh, both farming program and, the, and including the art experience in that, et cetera. Uh, that kind of meaningfulness to also something where you can create a uh, enough uh, a gravitational force that attracts people to you rather than you going to them. And so in terms of legacy, if any part of that actually happened, 
I think I feel pretty good about it. So. Emily and Stephen, do you want to contribute to the topic? Um, yeah, legacy. You know, I, I, if you know my work, and if you don't, Google me quickly. Um, but the work is very fast. It's complex. It's abstract. Um, uh, it's sexy. I'm happy if people think of that when they think of my work. But um, what I realized when I was forming this particular um, this particular endeavor, and what I realized was important to me was the time that I've spent in the unconscious, intuitive, creative state, barefoot with a bunch of other people in the room. And that is the thing that has changed my life. Um, and um, I realized that if I could, if I could create a place where other people could experience that to, uh, to trigger their creative process, that would be an incredible legacy to be part of. So that's the direction I've chosen to go. I mean, obviously I still have my company. I'm still making work. I believe very strongly in it. I think it's great, but um, there's nothing more precious than the next dance for me. And so that's, that's what I'm leaving uh, when I choose to leave. That's, I hope that's what it will be, so. Um, I have so many thoughts. I'll start by saying I actually, in terms of legacy, I, I think uh, specifically, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, the theater in London, uh, but artistic directors don't stay for more than 10 years there. It's frowned upon if you if you hang out for longer than 10 years. And I think there's something to that. I think that uh, we stick around too long in this country in terms of legacy. like. So that's a thought, uh, you know, I know some stuff, but other people know some stuff too. And I think a diversity of perspectives, particularly at the executive level uh, is really critical. And I think that the time in front of us is gonna call for it um, and inventiveness and innovation and, and all that jazz. So that's a thought. Um, with respect to sustainability, Getting back to this idea of listening, uh, I said I started the organization when I was 25 and I had no idea what the hell I was doing, but I did know to ask artists what they needed. Uh, I knew that much. And our programs came from the artists. You know, we have a family residency that's for working, um, predominantly working mothers and their kids. That came out of working mothers saying to me, hey, Emily, I can't be in residence for a week. Uh, I have another job called being a mom, uh, could there be some way to bring my kids? So we started this family residency. With that came funding. Then we heard another need. Oh, I'm a young playwright who didn't get a fancy master's degree. Uh, and I really need a way into the theater world. Could there be a place here for me? Now that's not to say that we have no mission and no vision. We have a very clear vision and mission of supporting artists and their work but critical and incumbent in that is asking them what they need. And I think that what that has done is that because the needs have not, um, have not been sort of imagined, but, but rather rooted in an actual need, there has been funding there for it, if that makes sense. And the last thing I'll say about that is <laughs> to the farming operation, I was, so mad at myself for taking over the farm. It was 2019 farming made running a nonprofit look like cartwheels. Um, and then the pandemic happened. And all of a sudden we couldn't gather for the artistic residencies, but food was something that our governor was saying everybody had access to. And so all of a sudden we were able to pivot and really meet people where they were there. Now I know not everybody has like a farm to their left or you know whatever, but I do think that like a multiplicity of programs, um, you know, we hear this word interdisciplinary thrown around, but I, I do think that there is something to that, uh, and I would say that space is is certainly a living testament to that being at least for 2020 a thing that helped us tremendously. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we have a question from James Fisher-Smith. 
um, who's involved with a 5,000 square foot community art space in Soho, and they're experiencing uh, obviously a lot of difficulties at the moment. And his question is, is there still space for an art world in lower Manhattan? That's <laughs> quite a question. Who, Eric? Uh, was it a couple of weeks ago in the Times crossword puzzle there was uh, something about, I uh, uh, wish I could remember the exact question, but it, it, it had to do with like a, like a, a place in, a, a, a thing in a, in a neighborhood in New York that was like a, a monument or something like that. And, uh, and I was like, what are they talking about? What is this? In fact, they, they named Soho. They said uh, uh, something, uh, you know, important in Soho, in this lower Manhattan Soho. And the answer in the puzzle was, it, it has to do with what used to be there. And it had to do with an art world <laughs> was the answer to it. So, the question that is being asked is a totally legitimate one. Is there a, uh, a uh, you know, a place for it? I, the, um, you know, what, what we're facing out here in Sag Harbor is the same thing people in New York are facing, which is that young artists can no longer afford to be here. So an, anything that can be done to bring talent to a place that they're, they're not gonna buy a house here. They're not gonna you know, become part of the community in the long term. But if there's something that you can do to, to help people that way, uh, then there is a, uh, there's I'm sure a need for it. So there's absolutely a legitimacy to it. But what that actually looks like in Soho, I have no idea. So there's been quite a few questions about board building. Um, about four different questions. So maybe you could all just touch on, I think you must all have amazing boards <laughs> and uh, directors. So if you just touch on that briefly, because we have about five minutes left. I'll let the old guys talk about that. <laughs> hey, watch it, you. Um, well, I have an incredible uh, chair, Jill Brienza. And, uh, you know, I've been around for 35 years. So, uh, well, I've been around a lot longer than that, but um, my board has been around for 35 years and it, you know, it shifts and changes all the time. And uh, when I was waiting to come onto this um, conversation, two people just joined the board, which I'm thrilled about. Um, uh, but I just, you know, you, you uh, need to keep, and it's hard right now because I'm not going out very much, but you need to keep going out and you need to keep um, the momentum of, of your artistic vision out in the world, it's a you know it's a social it's a social activity um, building a board and uh, people w need to be drawn to you and to your artistic vision or to what the mission of your of your um, organization is doing and if you're clear enough and if you put that out enough people will be drawn to it. Um, I will say one of the things um, Emily that I wanted to say about uh, that multiplicity. So we have a, a five bedroom house, you know, we're, we're, our, our retreat is small. We could fit up to 10, we have like 10 people up here. Um, but uh, we have a for-profit model that co coexists with our, our uh, not-for-profit model. So we do Airbnb um, when we're not uh, giving space away, we're charging for space. And honestly, during the pandemic, it's been the only thing that, um, that's, it's been the only source of earned income for us. And so what seemed like an improbable thing suddenly uh, shifted into high gear and people started coming up, uh, small families began renting the space for like months and two months at a time and kind of saved our butt. So having several different things going on in your space at once is a must, I will say that. Um, boards, uh, I wish I had, known more about them when I started space. I love my board. Uh, Robbie Stein, who's a, you know, Sag Harbor favorite is on the Zoom. So let's give it up for Robbie. Um, 
I'm really interested in what's going to happen with board building, specifically with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I do not know how we can have a group of people who are responsible for decision making of, of um, where the primary requisite is your uh, financial uh, situation. How, how are we actually, how can we look at that? H how, okay, if that's true, which right now, the nonprofit industrial complex, that's the deal. So if that's true, and every organization right now is charged um, with supporting a more diverse and all the ways we think about diversity, group of artists, makers, whatever, but the people at the table are predominantly white and affluent. I don't know how that squares. So I don't know what all the questions were, but I'm seriously interested to see how we as a sector start to look at this um, because the people at the, at the table make the decisions, right? And how can you make decisions for a diverse set of people if it's a pretty homogenous group of people at that table? I don't know. So I think we need to flip the table a little bit on boards. I'm not saying I have the answers. I definitely don't have the answers. Uh, but my board right now is doing a ton of training around uh, anti-racism. Uh, and I think it's necessary. So I have no idea if that was the question, but that is my strong opinion. Thank you, Emily. And I'm glad you brought up um, your, uh, your nine point plan for anti-racism, which um, you can, people can find on your website and it's very interesting reading. So unfortunately we're running out of time and before we say goodnight, I'm gonna introduce uh, Sarah Cochran, the executive director of the church to say a few words. But before that, I wanna thank Emily, <laughs> Stephen and Eric um, for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, I'm very inspired by what all, you, what all of you do. And if we were in the audience, I would give you a huge round of applause for your generosity, for your amazing generosity um, and what you do, um, it's, so, it's so needed. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah and say good night. Good evening. I would just like, sorry, we've got a bit of an echo. Hopefully that's a bit better. Um, I'd just like to thank all of our collaborators, Andrea, Elise, um, Patrick, and the whole crew at Guild Hall. Um, thank you to our panelists, uh, Emily, Stephen, Mary Jane for your moderation, and of course, Eric. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, uh, for sharing part of your Sunday with us. Um, in these challenging times, I think we all believe in the need for, the urgent need for the freedom, the fun, and the sort of thinking that the arts generally can provide for us. Um, we at the church are anxious to open our doors as soon as we can, um, anxious to welcome you into our space and anxious to deepen this collaboration, both here on the East End and also throughout the region. So this is good night for now, but uh, please look us up at sagharborchurch.org. Follow us all on social media. Your uh, participation in what each of our institutions does is our lifeblood. Um, and really just uh, goodbye for now, but looking forward to more of these to come and to seeing you, our audience, back in our spaces as soon as it is safe and possible. Thank you. <laughs>